Welcome to today's podcast, which is all about the devil. So there's a lot of interest at the moment in concepts of the devil in traditional witchcraft. And perhaps there's controversy too, because the character can be interpreted in so many ways. Is he the man in black, the leader of a coven? Is he a horned deity? Is he a character with whom we can make a pact? and maybe gain great power. Now they say that the devil always has the best tunes. And of course, there are many traditions of the devil teaching mortals to play the violin. He also has a history of tricking poets into giving him the best speeches, perhaps most famously in the character of Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost. And of course, one of his lines from that poem has become quite a common saying. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. It's quite well known, even if people don't know where it's from. Now, one of my favourite speeches, just because the language is so perfect, is in Marlowe's Dr Faustus. Now, Dr. Faustus wants to sell his soul to the devil to to gain great knowledge and wealth and power and women. Um, And uh, Mephistopheles is at this point in the play explaining to Faustus that he is one of the spirits who fell from heaven with Lucifer and that he is constantly in hell, never out of it wherever he is. And he warns Faustus not to sell his soul. And what he says is, Why, this is hell, nor am I out of it. Thinkst thou that I that saw the face of God and tasted the eternal joys of heaven am not tormented with ten thousand hells in being deprived of everlasting bliss? O Faustus, leave these frivolous demands which strike a terror to my fainting soul. So even though Mephistopheles is a a lesser devil, he's still trying to talk Faustus out of making that pact. So the devil, by the many different names that he's known, is a very complex being and one which may reward intellectual and magical study. Now, Chris Wood has recently written an article for Quest magazine entitled Better the Devil You Know. And he's with me today to talk about this topic. Hello. Hello. So, Chris, what inspired you, first of all, to, to write on this subject? I think in many ways it has been my involvement with interfaith that, uh, having started, I suppose, from the, the quite common um, pagan starting point of denying all aspects of devil worship, then finding that, oh, actually, certain figures that are related to the devil um, are significant in pagan witchcraft in particular, and indeed in the Western magical tradition. And therefore, trying to understand who these figures are, what they're all about, and how they developed. And this really came together recently, um, and I've I've felt a very strong need to uh, put it all together. Mm. So perhaps you'd like to talk first of all about, you know, what's the first section of your article, which is about witchcraft and and the devil. What um, what, what are your thoughts about those connections? Well, to some people, even today, uh, witchcraft and the devil go hand in hand. And certainly that was the case during the witch trials, uh, because in the latter part of that era, the church and, and government saw witchcraft as, by definition, the result of a pact with the devil. And 
The Witch Trials. Notoriously unreliable as they are, as uh, a guide to uh, magical practice at the time, it was, the ideas were based on popular and clerical assumptions uh, and, of course, extraction of confessions under torture. But those very images have been an inspiration to people in the modern era. Uh, there was the idea that there was a witch cult in the Middle Ages that was somehow a survival of pre-Christian practice. Margaret Murray is the most famous uh, proponent of that. And whilst that's been shown to lack evidence, to say the least, it was a major inspiration for modern pagan witchcraft, particularly Wicca. And that inspiration gave, gave us the horned god as the masculine divine power. But there does seem to have been a perhaps more direct inspiration uh, in the area of traditional witchcraft. And I'm using that both in the sense of historical folk witchcraft uh, and in the sense of capital T, capital C, traditional uh, craft uh, as a form of pagan or pagan-ish witchcraft today. There certainly were, from the 18th century onwards, those who did work with the devil. Uh, most famously, perhaps, uh, adherents of the, the horseman's word, uh, but others as well. Uh, cunning folk, uh, wise women, wise men. And we're talking here after the passing of the 1735 Witchcraft Act, which was what actually stopped, legally speaking, the witch trials. People did seek perhaps a frisson of edgy power, uh, or maybe a genuine, as with Dr. Faustus, a genuine pact with the devil for power. And a number of examples are cited in Nigel Pearson's book um, on uh, East Anglian witchcraft, uh, The Devil's Plantation. Yes, even he chose to put the devil into the title of his uh, of his his book. Yes, yeah. the devil not only in the detail. Though. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Michael Howard, uh, his book *Children of Cain*, a study of modern traditional witches. He also talks about the devil uh, playing a part in traditional craft. Now, for some parts of traditional witchcraft, the devil is a name along with the, the man in black. Uh, for a male leader of a coven. And that in itself can be seen as inspired by uh, the accounts of uh, medieval witch, witch meetings. Uh, but for many, the devil is actually a, a very real spiritual entity that is a, an initiator uh, and a provider of power, certainly. One of the aspects in which the, the devil is sometimes seen as an initiator is, is in the toad bone ritual, isn't it? Well, indeed. And this you know, brings us back to the horseman's word uh, as well. The idea of doing something transgressive. Uh, it's certainly not very nice for the poor toad. Um, to get hold of a special bone from that toad which is a symbol for the magical power that you have been granted or have claimed um, by going through that ritual. And after you've done the nasty with, with the toad, you then take the bones and you have to watch for the, the right one, which is going the wrong way in a flow, the flow in a stream without being distracted by all the noises off that suddenly start happening. And that's been likened to a sort of an initiatory duel or battle with the devil. And uh, as Nigel Pearson puts it, once, if you're successful, you have mastered the devil. Yeah, I find that really interesting because, you know, 
when you do the toad bone ritual, yes, it's transgressive. I mean, that that, that whole idea, it, it's certainly an East Anglian craft, that you have to put the poor toad into your shirt and the poor thing hops around inside there until it dies. I mean, to me, that, that, that would be a massive transgression to do. And, and also, you know, that you'd have to get over your feeling of, of how horrible it was to do that. Um, but... Uh, there's 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 a I'm I'm always confused about whether when you when you get to that point where you, where you the devil is there and you've got the bone have you mastered the devil or have you made a pact with him ah oh. Well, maybe you'd have to ask someone who's actually done it. To <laughs> well, I'm it. sure they would want to keep that a secret, <laughs> but uh, but maybe it depends on your exact tradition whether whether it is a pact or whether you you see yourself as having mastered the the devil well, himself. Well, indeed, and uh, there is an interesting case. The most famous nineteenth century cunning man is James Cunning Murrell of Hadley in Essex, and his stock in trade was uncovering uh, and a dealing with malevolent witchcraft. Uh, obviously he promoted the idea that malevolent, malevolent witchcraft exists in order to uh, boost demand for his business. He claimed to be the devil's master. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't mm. it? Uh, and that gave him his power over, over bewitchment. So one, one does wonder what that meant. You know, was that just something he said? To um, to show that well, you know, that devil de devil's got nothing on me, mate. Uh, or you know, had he done something to actually achieve magical mastery over the devil? Well, he certainly had done something, hadn't he? Because he was a very powerful man, and not only that, but you know, his his story and his reputation live on, don't they? Indeed, uh, I, mean, I was watching a video recently where the researchers at the Museum of London uh, Archaeological Unit were talking about uh, witch bottles, um, usually Bellamine Bartman stoneware bottles, but Cunning Murrell was one of those who experimented with iron witch bottles. Not uh, very successfully, however. Uh, couple of examples they cited on, on that video involved half of cottages being blown up. Just imagine you heat urine in a uh, metal bottle. Uh, if it explodes, it's basically going to go off like a grenade <laughs> or a mortar bomb. Yes, not ideal at all. Um, so, yeah, the his reputation lives on, um, for good or ill. Uh, but uh, there are, obviously there are many other people who would be put under the heading cunning folk and none of them were necessarily uh, completely good in what they did um they uh, the idea of black and white witches which is a relatively modern idea uh rather simplifies the situation i think yes i think a, a lot of them were, were quite um trickster like characters weren't they um I mean, one of my favourites, who I've mentioned before, of course, was uh, Mrs Mortimer of, of Great Yarmouth. And she uh, helped somebody who had been poisoned by some sausages that he'd won in a raffle. But as part of the payment, she asked for some of his hair and nail clippings. And then he went home, got better and... Uh, she demanded further payment which had not been agreed in advance and when he refused to pay um, he then mysteriously became ill again and uh, it was it was likely that, that that he would die unless he was uh, unless he paid the money so you know so so although she would have been considered to be a cunning woman she she was also a little bit on the dark side and a bit of a trickster character herself absolutely is it Bit of a magical protection racket, you could yes, say. Yes, definitely. But uh, the it's interesting you mentioned tricksters because who is the devil of traditional witchcraft? Parts of traditional witchcraft. 
Well, he is in many ways a trickster, and that comes as much as anything from the folk idea of the devil. Yes, in popular parlance, uh, for a long time, the devil has been seen on one level as the bad guy of the Bible and so on. But on another level, he's, he's someone who breaks the rules. He's someone who allows a bit of freedom that's not normally allowed by church or state. And it might bring some illicit pleasures. He's a bit naughty. That's a very different character to Satan. Yeah, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the, the origins of Satan, which, according to your article, are very specific, aren't they? Well, yes. I mean, the Satan, or a Satan, was originally an angel or other entity sent by Yahweh to test people. Um, and therefore, part of God. Now, OK, um, there is also the argument that, uh, in you know, the Judeo-Christian perspective, it... God created the world and everything, then he also created Satan. Um, but here we see Satan as an emissary of God. Um, but that changed because well, Judea went through a lot of trauma. It got invaded by the Babylonians, it got invaded by Egypt earlier on, it and then, of course, it got invaded by Rome. Now, Satan changed during this period, particularly from the Maccabean War, uh, which was in the 2nd century BCE, and then the Judean War of 65 to 70 CE. You've got Judaism making its enemies other. And then Christianity does the same thing, making its enemies the other. And Satan came to be this figure of the bad other. Uh, he's very much forged in war, one could say, the Maccabean and the Judean war in particular. He's no longer the, the trickster. He has become destruction, hatred, fear and lies. Hmm, interesting. Um and it, it, isn't it interesting as well that, um, that that very often people use Lucifer as a synonym for Satan? Indeed, in in Doctor Faustus, you know, Lucifer is is really the the kind of uh, the satanic character, the person who's in charge of hell. And yet, for me, um, Lucifer has always been the light bringer, the morning star, a character that that you can work powerfully with in a witchcraft context, but but in in a very positive, if slightly dangerous way. Absolutely. Uh, Lucifer pervades the Western mystery tradition. Uh, Wolfgang von, von Eschenbach identified the grail with the emerald that fell from Lucifer's crown. Lucifer is there... Not necessarily shouted out, but clearly there in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and its sky on the uh, Stella Matutina, which is uh, a name meaning star of the morning. Lucifer morning star is, is the essence of human striving towards divinity, spark of star stuff in all of us. Bearer of curiosity, who dares to look outside Plato's cave. He shows the path to wisdom to achieve which is to walk and be that path. Is life aware of itself and thinking of something better? And uh, that fantasy of something better is really important. It's what makes us truly human, to be able to imagine something else and create it, whether that's by hard graft with our hands or by magical means. Uh, and I like my favourite Terry Pratchett quote is from Hogfather, where death says... Humans need fantasy to be human, to be a place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Now, Lucifer, uh, in the standard interpretation, is a fallen angel. But the association of Lucifer with Satan, fallen angels, etc., etc., actually came about when the Vulgate Bible was written. The Vulgate Bible was the Latin version, translated out of... Uh, Hebrew and, and Greek, by Jerome. 
and this was in the, the 4th century CE. And there's a critical passage in Isaiah, which, according to the King James Version, again, translated again into English now, of course, uh, according to the King James Version, Isaiah 14, 12 reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Interestingly, the New International Version has changed again, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. But actually, in the Hebrew, it wasn't Lucifer at all. It was uh, Hillel. And that was probably a political attack on a Babylonian king. And the, but the idea of uh, a shining one that falls from grace through hubris gets put together with various myths of a rebellion of angels against God, proud angels, turned into the idea of Satan being cast out of heaven um, to rule in hell and corrupt humanity, which again is actually not that different from Adam and Eve being cast out of the Garden of Eden. Yes, they're repeated patterns, aren't they? They are, they are. But it's uh, Jerome that changes Hellel to Lucifer. And Lucifer does actually exist in classical mythology. Uh, a relatively minor character, but he starts off um, in Greek as Phosphorus or Hyosphorus, uh, and that gets translated into Latin as Lucifer. Light bringer or light bearer, he's the son of the door. You know, he, as the morning star, as Venus rising and shining in the dawn sky before the sun rises, that's the herald of the dawn, the initiator of the new day. Of course, when Venus shines after the sun has set, the evening star, that's the initiator of night. So Lucifer and Noctifer, his brother, they are the bookends of the day, if you like. They initiate the next phase. And obviously you can make all sorts of associations with that. Uh, and that polarity between light and dark is actually quite central to modern traditional witchcraft. Wicca focuses very much on the masculine, feminine, or male, female polarity, which is a powerful for, uh, source of magic. But... Traditional craft, generally speaking, tends to focus more on the light and dark. Now, that's not the same as good and evil. No. Do you remember the uh, Twelfth Night ritual that we did um, when we'd been asked by Matt Fox to put on a spectacular traditional craft ritual to impress his Wiccan coven? And uh, perhaps you remember that that I actually played the part of Lucifer uh, bringing down the light from the heavens and you played the part of, of Tubal Cain, the first smith, who took that light into the, uh, into the forge. But uh, it, it was quite a startling event, wasn't it? Because um, as I often like to do in rituals, because I, I, I do love a bit of pyrotechnics and drama, uh, I'd, I'd prepared myself a flaming torch for, for, for the moment of my uh, descent from heaven and, uh, and laced it with, with plenty of paraffin so that it would burn very brightly. Now, normally when I do that, you get a bright yellow, flame and I've done it lots of times but do you remember I, I said the speech of Lucifer that, that I'd written for a previous ritual but that same speech and as I brought the torch down towards the forge it glowed green and everybody gasped and I think you know, Lucifer was definitely there uh, that that day, and then as Tubal Cain, you you received that flame and and took it to work in the forge. And that's a really important thing as well because Lucifer is the light bringer. Uh, he and other culture heroes, tricksters, and so on, bring knowledge and skills. And alongside Lucifer, we have and the. The, we have the tradition of specific fallen angels called the Watchers, who are chucked out of heaven or descend from heaven, depending on who's telling the story, 
and they come to Earth and they teach humans little things like uh, agriculture, metal craft and so on, herb craft, things that uh, the establishment doesn't necessarily want the ordinary people to know. And it's the ordinary people, particularly women, who are given this knowledge by the Watchers. And they mate with mortal women and they create a, a race called the Nephilim, who are, again, according to who tells the story, either demigods or monsters. Yes, I mean, and, and they're, they're a powerful and important force in, in, in the practice of tr certain kinds of traditional witchcraft, aren't they? they, they the, the understanding of that race has, has been important to, to magic in many respects. Yes, and the idea of someone who has been initiated either by birth, in that sort of way, or through being touched by the gods in another way, or having a, the spark of divinity within themselves being fanned into life by this experience. That is perhaps um, the witch mark, the mark of Cain and so on that's talked about, uh, which, yeah, the mark of Cain is usually seen as a sign of transgression, Cain killing Abel. But it's also about becoming more, developing, becoming truly human, if you like, becoming one with the gods. Yes, uh, of course, as, uh, as Robert Cochrane famously wrote. He did indeed. Uh, however, the you know, tricksters also show that there is a price to pay for that. And unfortunately, Robert Cochrane uh, paid a price. for Indeed. Um, and some of the tricksters, I'll use that word generally because, you know, whether you're talking about great figures like Lucifer uh, or the uh, King of the Rats in Roman tradition, they, all, they can all be described as tricksters on one level. Uh, but some of them do pay the price for giving humanity things. Prometheus is perhaps... One of the most obvious examples, yeah. because uh, he brings a lot of th lot of things to humanity, a bit like the Watchers. You know, he brings fire, he brings technology, uh, knowledge of agriculture, and so on. Zeus isn't Zeus isn't very keen on this. Um, well, in some versions, Prometheus even creates humanity. Uh, so Zeus chains him to a rock and has his an eagle come along and peck out his liver on a regular basis. The li liver, liver regrows and an eagle comes back. Zeus eventually finds that he needs Prometheus's help, so has to release him. Hmm. But we also have uh, more obvious figures that go too far. You know, we have Wayland Smith, for instance, uh, or indeed uh, Icarus, who flies too close to the sun. Um, so the trickster tales also serve to tell us we, sh we shouldn't go too far. We've got to be careful and play by play by divine rules, if you like, at the very least. Yes, but at the same time, strive, as Robert Cochrane said, to defeat fate and become one with the gods. Absolutely, absolutely. There's always that balance. And the thing you find about tricksters is that they sometimes end up rebelling against themselves. Uh, two particular cases spring to mind. One is Loki. Then um, he and Thor go out to Utgarth, where they are pitted against Utgarth Loki. Hmm, interesting similarity of name there. And there's another case from the northwest coast of, uh, of North America, uh, from the, the Tlingit people, where uh, their trickster, Raven, actually... Um, is up against another raven, uh, raven at uh, the uh, head of a particular river valley. The trickster creates a new reality by rebellion, change, whatever the trickster does to change things, creates a new reality. But that new reality can then become too concrete, too static, 
it becomes a stasis that needs to be re rebelled against. So the trickster ends up rebelling against himself. Yes, because we have to continue learning. We, we cannot allow ourselves to stagnate, can Absolutely. we? Absolutely. We must always strive to, for, the, for the next step and, and to renew ourselves, to renew our knowledge and, and, and move further along the path. Absolutely. Yet another twist of the labyrinth. <laughs> Well, that was really interesting. Um, thank you very much for your insights on that. And perhaps you could uh, tell people, of course, they can they can read the article now in Quest, which is newly out. But for anybody who doesn't have a subscription and can't get hold of Quest, uh, will you be posting your article anywhere else in the future? I will. Uh, I have already put it on academia.edu and ResearchGate. Uh, so if you've so got access to those academic um, social media platforms, if you like, uh, then you can find it there. But I will, in, in due course, I'm not saying when at this stage, uh, I will in due course post it so that it's available on uh, the Norwich Pagan Sphere and, uh, and via the Norwich Pagan Moot website as well. Um, uh, and also probably via the Ikin Collection website. But obviously it's just been published in Quest, so it's only fair to subscribers to um, give it a while before it's uh, in general circulation. Because um, most Quest readers probably won't be looking at uh, academia.edu and ResearchGate, but uh, um, it's only fair to, to leave it a while. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And thank you for talking to me about this interesting topic today. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, there's plenty more to research and plenty more to say about this very complex subject. Absolutely. And it is a complex subject. And it's impossible, I think, ever to be able to write a full history of the development of any of these figures we've talked about. Uh, Satan, the devil... Lucifer. It's such a complex matter that, yeah, I, I think it would be a challenge beyond human capability <laughs> to actually write that. And, you know, there's lots of things we haven't touched on here, such as um, the uh, where, where the uh, Roma fit into this, because their word devil or devil is their word for God. Indeed. And that is... A really interesting thought on which to close, isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you.